Uh, let's see, you've met uh, my partner over here, Beth. You know what she's all about. Uh, my name is Ray Bear. I've been in the community for quite a while. Uh, been flying something like, I don't know, I lose track, I'm old. 35 <laughs> years or something like that. I've uh, been instructing uh, something like uh, 30 of those years. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm a better instructor now than when I started. Beth made that point, uh, and Don did too. The first time out, uh, you, in some sense, you're learning as much as the student's learning. And so my instructor experience has gotten a little bit better. Uh, this last session is designed to a large extent to be a review session to, but to try to pick out the nuggets of what we uh, have talked about all afternoon. The, um, the emphasis to start with is once again the practical test standards. There is no alternative to the practical test standards. And I, I would uh, take my DPE hat off just for a moment and put my instructor hat on. When I signed my student off for the check ride, uh, by the way, I sent all my students to Beth uh, I won't make any effort to go through the process of uh, testing my own students. But the point I want to make is I have a form that's in the, my final evaluation form, and it fundamentally it's just a checklist of the PTS. I give the form to my student, and I keep a, a piece of the form, and each of us um, rates each of the tasks, every task, in every area of operation. And they rate it A, B, C, D. A, I've got this shit down cold, you know. <laughs> B, yeah, I've got it pretty good, but not perfect. And C, there might be a hole or two in there that Beth's gonna find. And D is, I've never heard of this. Um, and, that sounds and the, like F to me. <laughs> the, the instructor, uh, me, fills it out, and my student fills it out, and we fill it out independently. And then we get back together and we compare. Because the telling is not teaching idea comes to the fore in this thing. I give the guy a B or a C, and they write down D because they've never heard of the topic, and I've taught it at least three times. No, I've told them at least three times. And so I find that to be a very valuable tool as a final evaluation. And it gives us something to chat about as we go down and uh, where we have differences of opinion. Uh, we're going to talk about the very same areas of operation that we've been talking about in the afternoon. But in some of the slides, we've highlighted the areas of importance, or that's the wrong term, maybe the area of difficulty and that sort of thing. And those will have a couple of asterisks in there uh, to highlight that and might encourage some discussion. And, and I think you all know this, but Ray and I are the two designated pilot examiners in the Albuquerque area. So when your students are done and they're ready for a check ride, ready to become pilots, you're going to come to one of the two of us, at least uh, if Ray doesn't retire like he's threatening to. Um, and, and we're going to be using the practical test standards. And that's why this says student readiness from an examiner's point of view, because because both of us are instructors, but we have to evaluate people based on the practical test standards, not our personal preferences. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that is, uh, uh, a lot of it is subjective. But we're looking at it from an examiner point of view, not so much an instructor point of view, although it could be both. Tools, so, <laughs> I can go as fast or as slow as I want. <laughs> so, I so we. Those of you who have attended the private ground school, when I used to do the kind of the DPE wrap up or JD wrap, I always kept that in my hand so I could move on to the next slide. <laughs> Jamie's willing to spend a little extra time. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I have some of the same tendencies as JD, unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, um, so we've already talked about the practical test standards as your main of preparation for, for your students to get ready for the check ride. And those are, again, minimum standards. I personally, if the, the standard is that they have to fly level within 100 feet, I'm not going to sign them off if that's all they can do. They got to do half that for two reasons. Because it's a minimum and I want them to be better than the minimum. And secondly, because everybody's nervous on their check ride. And 
If you're nervous, you don't always fly your best. If you're not flying your best, I still want you within that criteria. So the practical test standards are your best gu guideline, and they're dated 1996 and 1997. Those are the most current ones. They actually rewrote them, revised them, and we're getting ready to publish them when when the FAA decided they weren't going to use practical test standards anymore. They're going to something called ACS, and they've done that for. It's supposed to tie everything together better, and they've done that so far for private pilot airplane and instrument ratings. So it's going to be a while till they get down to us, so we're going to be using this one for quite some time to come. Not only will I retire before that happens, Beth is liable I to, I probably too. will. <laughs> yeah, they're saying two years, and I don't believe them. They haven't even gotten to... They, before they get to us, they'll have to finish all the airplane stuff. They'll do helicopters. They'll do... They'll do pretty much every other form of aviation before they get to balloons, because we are definitely the redheaded stepchildren. Sorry, Debbie. Janet. <laughs> Go ahead. Am I on? Yeah. OK, I wasn't sure. Um, the, the PTS has more than just the areas of operation in here. This identifies the main sections of it. And one that you should really read is the introduction, because there are points that are useful to the instructor that are talked about in the introduction itself, particularly the defining of satisfactory and unsatisfactory performance. And the use of distractions is discussed in there as well. And uh, so you should be aware of that. Then and of course- you should also be aware that Ray is a very subtle master of that. He's, I'm a little more overt. He's very, very good at it. So your students need, need to be prepared to be distracted. But I will reveal my secret. The secret is, during the oral, I will learn something about you that you are very interested in, whether it's raising Persian cats uh, or, uh, I mean, I, it doesn't matter, because all of us have sort of some passion or interest in an area. And once I pick up on that, the light comes on, and I know I will use that tomorrow during the flight. He's very good at it. I think by now you all realize that there are eight areas of operation for the private pilot, and then we add those three that are indi indicated there uh, for the commercial. So really, the only two that are brand new are the FOI, which I just talked about, and preparing a lesson, which you, and it's perfectly acceptable on a check ride to use the BFA flight instructor manual. You don't have to start all over. Some people don't like it, and they do start all over. That's fine, too. Uh, but there's a specific sequence, and the first thing has to be the objective. You can't know if you got there if you don't know where you're going. So the first thing on any lesson plan is going to be the objective. Some people skip that. You can't skip that. Uh, but those are the only two new sections, the FOI and the pre-flight lesson. Technical subjects is just taking some other things from the practical, or, or excuse me, from the private practical test standards and combine them into one thing. But it's the same information, so it just really has two new things. So here's all of them for the project. There they are, yeah. <laughs> We've already talked about them. So we have asterisks on the places that the two of us have found most people to have issues with. And so those are particular areas that, as an instructor, you're going to make sure you cover. Yeah, those are some of them. On the national short. airspace system, there's a couple of elements to it. Number one is you can identify what the airspace is, particularly in a sectional or something like that. And then, once you've done that, relating the requirements of the airspace. Um, so I, I think if there were just one on there, it would be national airspace system. Flight planning itself is a weakness, quite frankly, of Albuquerque. Uh, we are so spoiled in that we can, quote, land anywhere, not quite true, but you get the point. Uh, whereas if you're flying back in the east, uh, you're going to find that landing anywhere is not an option. As Dale identified earlier, he found out there's a tree or two in Georgia. Uh, and if you have never flown over a forest, uh, it's pretty intimidating the first time or two. The closest we get to it locally would be Las Cruces. 
those of you who have flown over the pecan orchards down there, it kind of goes on and on and on if you got the right uh, wind direction. But so, f so flight planning, while it's important, is not well practiced in Albuquerque, quite frankly. And we do emphasize it. We might say, okay, if the conditions are what you've been telling me they're supposed to be and what we're seeing now, where can we land in an hour? And sometimes they'll tell me something that's a half a mile away and the winds are 10 knots. Like, really? How is that going to work? So they need to think those things through. Where are you going to end up? Now, whether you actually end up there or not is a whole different issue, especially here. But, but they need to be at least thinking about it. Yeah, in the final phase of a check ride, if conditions be normal, I usually ask the applicant to identify where they would like to do the final landing. And it's not to be a minute away, it's to be at least a few minutes away. And where it is, because I'm looking for their navigational skill and their thought processes, it's not quite important, well, it, it's significant, but, but not so much, of do they hit the spot they identified? I mean, all of us in ballooning know about plan B, plan C, and so on. So it's not the issue that they hit the spot. What I'm trying to dig out of them is what is their thought process. So once they identify the place, I'll ask a question something like, well, what's the sequence uh, that you're going to use to get to it? And so we try to test that process. Uh, it's part of decision making, it's part of navigation, and it's part of their uh, skill illustration. In, in airspace, as, as Ray was saying, you need to tie it all together. So if it's class C, Charlie airspace, they need to know what it looks like. It's magenta rings and that one is above the ground and it tells you exactly how high MSL on the sectional. They should have some idea where those rings are in real life. And what do they need to do to fly in there when you're not in Albuquerque? Well, they need a transponder to begin with, and we don't typically have them. Uh, the one I have is 1999 and severely out of inspection. So I can't even go fly with my own transponder at the moment. Anyway, so they need to know you have to have a, a transponder. You need to communicate with the tower. You need to have three miles of visibility. You need to stay 500 feet below the clouds. And that's typically what we do because you don't usually have the clearance to go above the clouds 1,000 feet and horizontally 2,000 from every cloud. It just doesn't work that way well, typically. But they need to know those things and tell you if they've got the proper conditions. The last check ride I did, I said, okay, what are the requirements we need? We're in the class. He said, we're in the class D airspace. What are the requirements? Uh, three miles of visibility, uh, three, uh, 500 feet below clouds, 1,000 above, 2,000 horizontal. We both looked around and started laughing. Yeah. You could see 30 miles and there were no clouds. So it's not as much of an issue here sometimes, but in other places it definitely is. Is, is there anyone in here who thinks we do not need a transponder in Class C airspace. Fred, would you like to convince us of that? That doesn't matter. What's that got to do with it? You gotta be really no. careful. You gotta be it really careful. Not. Because the regulation says transponder is required of all aircraft in Class others to C airspace. Okay. Then it goes down to talk about flying within the, um, that's the transponder ring, that's the, the um, mode C, mode C nine, 30 ring, nautical mile range, the 30 mile thing, thir in class that's B. where the exception of the electrical system comes in. It allows a balloon to fly inside that ring, but not in class B airspace, or class C for that matter. So you got to read it really careful. Um, this is Saturday night. I'm sure you got something better to do, but when you wonder what to do with yourself, read 91.215. And it also says you need to have that up to 10,000 feet. So even if you're above Albuquerque's airspace, if it wasn't Albuquerque, I mean, Albuquerque has a verbal agreement that you don't have to have it. Uh, but Albuquerque's airspace only goes up to 9,400. You still have to have the transponder to 10,000 feet. There's no exemptions for those things. And above 10,000. No. That's right. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, well, I was just an aside. Thank you, Fred. I appreciated that. So pre-flight, they're still nervous then. It's the beginning of the check ride, and, and they're usually pretty nervous, and sometimes they have a lot of problems with this. They aren't paying attention to what's going on. I had a guy inflate where he was clearly, if the balloon shifted 10 degrees, he was going to be on top of somebody else's trailer when he had plenty of room to pull up somewhere else. It's like He's clearly not thinking things through. So they need to be paying attention to, to all of these pre-flight items, but a, a, particularly the pre-flight inspection, people might have the checklist, they carry it around with them. They never once look at it, and they skip stuff. Yeah, and, and another thing in this area is the allowable damage on your system. Uh, usually if I, we walk around the balloon, I'll say, do you have any unrepaired damage on this balloon? The answer is always no, but in fact, it may be different than no, but you, your students really need to understand what the allowable damage on their system is. And this, this is not a page worth of allowable damage. I'm interested in, are you really allowed that quarter inch hole above the equator? Some do, some don't. So it's important that you teach that and that you understand it. And, and particularly since if something happens in flight, let's say you're flying and you hit a tree and you tear the balloon, can you keep on flying or do you need to land as soon as you can? They're not going to look that stuff up in flight. They should have some idea before they take off what kind of damage they can have. Now, probably if they hit a tree, they're going to want to land, but <laughs> that's a whole different issue. And then the pre-launch check. Part of that involves clearing the airspace above them. I've had people that never, ever ever forget that in training, but they'll forget it on their check ride because they're nervous. They didn't look at the checklist. It's on there. It's on mine anyway. I guess I would comment primarily on the Double Eagle Class D airport. Uh, I find that there are people who have never contacted the airport. They've, at best, they've read the uh, uh, AIM, and they got some sense of what goes on. But what the, the response is, I, if we're not actually talking to them, and we're going in a different direction, I will ask for a sample communication. And what I get back is, well, let's see, I would tell them this and that. And Instead of a sample communication, I get a description of the communication. I really want the communication. Right, so I tell them, I'm going to be the tower, you talk to me. And, and if, they, if you've never flown in, in Double Eagles airspace, make them practice it. they got to practice it before the check ride. So I, I did have somebody recently that the first time she actually had to talk to the Double Eagle Tower was on her private check ride. But she'd practiced it seven, eight, nine times, and she did fine. She said, oh, I've never actually done this before. And then that was the last thing she said about it. Then she called them, told them everything she needed to tell them, and we flew on. And Double Eagle will, on rare occasion, not allow you in their airspace. I have one example, and it was on a check ride, and it was Judy Nakamura. <laughs> <laughs> and we're flying toward the airspace, and she attempted to communicate with them. They couldn't quite hear us. I think the battery on her radio was low or something. They knew we were trying to make contact, but they could not pick up the registration, the balloon registration, the end number. And finally, they came back about the third time and said, we cannot understand your communication. Access is denied. And that's the only time it's ever happened to me. But it was a very interesting time to have it happen. <laughs> I, I could tell Judy wasn't quite sure what do we do now, you know? Well, so. I have had it happen. They're doing it a little more frequently because what the FAA told me is that the manager is crabby. <laughs> but if they're too busy, and if they're really busy and they can't deal with us, they'll tell us we can't go in. And I had it happen on a private check ride also. And it caused us some problems because that's where we were planning on going. So the check ride ended up being an hour and 50 minutes as we worked our way back from the volcanoes to, to 
below the cliff where we could land uh, and not end up in an inaccessible place. So it can be an issue. You need to talk to them as soon as possible to make sure they are going to let you in there. Because if they're really busy, they won't. I don't think it's just because the guy's crabby. I think it has to do with how busy they are. If you're hearing a lot of radio chatter, chatter they might not let you go in there. Um, the, the lights, that's another silly thing. <laughs> But at least it's easy. There's very few things in that whole list of light signals that will apply to you. And I didn't even know what it was when it first came up. I thought they were talking about runway lights or something. I had to ask Sid, I was working for Sid Cutter at the time, I had to ask him because he flew both helicopters and airplanes. And it's a light gun, they shine it at you only. And when I asked the tower at one point if they'd ever used that with a balloon, they said, well, it's kind of a moot point. First, we would never have considered it, but second thing, it hasn't worked in five years, so. <laughs> yeah, I was out there on a, on a tower tour, and I asked the guy at the top of the tower, I said, could I see one of these light guns? He says, yeah, I think we got one around here someplace. I mean, they had no idea what it was. Yeah, so they don't use them very often, but there's only a few that apply to us. If it's steady green and you want to land there, you can. And this is assuming your aircraft radio doesn't work. If it's flashing red, you can't land. If it's alternating red and green when you're coming in, I don't even know what that means. It means extreme caution. What does that mean? All that's going to do is make me more nervous. I'm but, always cautious, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and the rest of them we can't even do. If they ever used them, that assumes that you're flying in because if you haven't taken off yet, you can call them on the telephone or the radio. If, if your radio is not working, you call them on the phone. And the rest of them don't apply, so even if they thought about using them, which apparently they don't, there's so few of them that would apply that it's an easy thing to get through. You don't need to spend a lot of time on that with your students, but it is on the PTS, even though it's silly. What do you want to talk about on approach to landing? Um, that's one of the more difficult areas. Even if they're usually pretty good, again, when they're nervous, they tend to do this. And uh, so if they're doing this when they're supposed to be landing, then they're bonking you into the ground and missing their spot and sometimes running into stuff. So make sure they've done enough landings in not just in perfect conditions, because it might not be perfect on their check right. It might change that they're comfortable if the situation changes and it's not their normal landing. Well, Beth made an important point earlier. Frequently, a low-hour pilot overburns as they approach the ground. They come down, they overburn, and they're back up. You really have to teach your students to use their vent. As soon as they detect that balloon turning around, they've got a vent. Vent, vent, vent. You know, when I'm in the balloon with a student, I actually start doing this, you know. <laughs> Then, then, it's time, you know. It, but it doesn't work. We, we go back up anyway. But. And I'm looking at it and trying to hold my hand behind my back. So, <laughs> there's a vent over there. So, so I don't let my, vent, my students vent at first because I want them to get used to how the balloon reacts and make sure if they overburn, they know how much they overburned and what to do instead. But, boy, they better know how to use it by the time they land. Don Boyer had problems with that. Wasn't that you? They, they, he was never allowed to touch the vent except on landing. And that was what Sid said to him on the, on the check ride when he's climbing when he's not supposed to. You have a vent, use the damn thing! Paid good money for it. Yeah, paid good money for it. <laughs> well, a lot of instructors do that at first because... They want you to understand how the balloon reacts with your burn or your overburn, but as the lessons proceed, that vent is every bit as much a control as the burner, and you should be using it. And if they haven't actually done a high wind landing, at least simulate them with it, you simulate it with them. So, I mean, if you're coming along at five knots, pull the top out of it so they have some idea. Because typically what they'll forget to do is shut off the pilot lights. They might have to do it more than once. And, and I don't want them starting a, a, a Mesa fire on the check ride should we happen to have a high wind landing. Let me comment on descents. Uh, I find that 
applicants, especially at the private level, can control ascents reasonably well, they can control level flight reasonably well, but perhaps cannot control a descent reasonably well. Uh, the balloon typically gets too cold, and so then they start down too fast, then they overburn, and yeah, they might still be descending, but they're doing this on the way down. And uh, that's, that's a skill that has to be developed fairly early on. Tethering, um, you have to have at least talked about it with them, even if you haven't actually done it. Uh, so they need to know the basics, and it's hard to find things on tethering. You can see the basic triangle. Here's upwind, you got two lines. Here's downwind, you got one. And that's about all you can find, and all the trucks are backwards, and all the diagrams drives me crazy, because it should be tying off to the heavy end. People who draw them backwards obviously did not do the kind of commercial work I did, where you pick the back of the van or the truck up, if that was the only thing you had to tie to, and dragged it across the field before you finally said, I can't do this anymore, I have to quit, and they got mad. Um, you don't want to be picking up the back of the truck in a moderate wind. You want to tie it off to the heavy part. Uh, and how, where you tie it off is, is there's several options, but the back shouldn't be one of them. Um, but beyond that, there's not a lot of written information, so make sure they have some idea of, of how long the rope should be and what size they should be and how strong they should be and crowd control and how many crew do they need and what do the crew do. Because sometimes they can show me the diagram in, in the, the FAA balloon flying handbook. Say we set it up by this, like this. Okay, what else? That's all they can tell me, nothing else because there's not a lot written about it. But you should give them some guidance there. And if you don't have that information, ask me. I have it. Yeah, I got it the, written down to give my students. At, at the private level, a discussion may be adequate. I believe at the commercial level, they must have done it. Me too. Um, because and Ray's actually done that on check rides. He's made them tether before they took off. I'm not quite that ambitious yet, because <laughs> it's time consuming. So they have to have done a tether before their commercial because we make them, may make them do one on their check ride. Winter flying, most people here do that. We've been flying all winter, not that it's been very flyable, but most people here understand heat tapes or nitrogen pressurization or whatever and what they have to do to, to raise the, the um, pressure in the tank so we have enough power to fly. Um, but mountain flying, we're not, most people fly around in the valley, but they, what they're talking about is not flying in the valley near a mountain. What do you have to think about if you're going to fly over a mountain? They don't have to actually have done it, but they should have some idea what they need to know so they know what their limitations are, and probably they're not ready for that yet. Have any of you experienced a mountain wave on the backside of a mountain? Oh, good it really does exist. Uh, as, as examiners, we get a, quote, check ride once a year. And I remember one I did with JD. We flew out of uh, Las Lunas and flew over the Manzanos. And about the time we were at the peak or shortly thereafter, JD said, I'd like to fly. I said, OK. And we had a good mountain wave out there, and he couldn't hold altitude. So I gave him a really bad time about that. Uh, but you can't. But it is real. That's the point. Yeah, it is definitely real. And if they're strong, they're scary. So you got to pick your day pretty carefully before you're flying over the mountains. And they have to understand that, too. What kind of weather are they looking for? What kind of weather do they absolutely not want to go in? Good and bad direction is probably the best of uh, the topics up there. Because what we're looking for there is your situational awareness of where you are if you're in the flight. Or if you're ha discussing a launch site or whatever, uh, it's part of flight planning. What are the good directions and the bad directions? You don't want to be flying toward town. You'd rather be flying out this way or you know, pick your direction from your launch site. And you should have a sense of what's good and what's bad. And here's an example of that. I gave a check ride recently to somebody 
who had been flying out on the Mesa. And when we took off, that's where we were going. It all shifted. We started flying over the old part of Rio Rancho where there's power lines everywhere. And the valley had fog, which then started rolling up the hill toward us. And I wanted to make sure he was aware of that. But before I even asked him, he said two things. He said, well, the fog is starting to come toward us. If I have to dump this thing at my skill level, I can probably get the balloon in here, 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 which he probably could have. He said, but I don't think the balloon will survive. <laughs> which was probably also true. But he was thinking about it, and he was aware of the change in in the fog coming toward us instead of just hanging around in the valley like it was. And, and he'd never flown in that part of town. Um, so he's saying, what I'd like to do is try and get over here because I know there's landing places over there. Well, it, we did eventually. Everything changed again, and we did go that way, luckily for him, <laughs> because he probably couldn't have put it in one of, those, one of those small spots with power lines all around it without damaging the balloon. But I believe you could have gotten in there without hurting us. And at that point, that might have been the most important thing. <laughs> You know, in, in talking about sensitive areas, uh, we have no better resource in this area than the AIBF map, whether it's electronic or paper. It describes the situation as well as we can. So I would encourage you to have, who have students that might come in from out of town, try to provide them with a map or show them how to load the electronic version on their phone because it's very useful and it's important to all of us who fly in Albuquerque that the landowner relations remain good. And I personally like the electronic version just because it shows you where they are. And so if they're not familiar with the area, they can at least say, oh, I'm this blue dot and I'm getting close to this red area. Whereas if they're trying to figure it out on a map when they're not even familiar with Albuquerque, it's really difficult on any check ride, but particularly a, a private one, just so they don't get distracted. You had a question? No. no. Okay. Emergencies. We are not allowed to cause an actual emergency. We cannot turn off the pilot lights. We cannot shut off tanks. We can not purposely fly them toward a power line where they have to rip out to keep from killing us. But we can simulate all that stuff, and we will. Yeah, I, I frequently will have a, a hop, if you will, and land if we can stand up. And I will tell them to shut off their pilot light and relight something. Um, because I, I think it's important that they actually perform the, that particular emergency operation. And I do the same thing with leaks. I tell them, don't, don't tell me what you would do. I want you to show me what you'd do. Well, we got two blast valves. So if they shut off one, we can still fly. So we're not, we're not getting, if we only have one, I'm not doing that, but, but if we have another backup system of some sort available, I want them to show me what to do, not just tell me, because some of them have never practiced it. And they can sort of tell you, but they can't do it. And that's a common thing too. Leaks is probably the most common thing to happen these days. Yeah, especially in the winter. Um, water landing is almost amusing because what, what you might do in the Rio Grande hardly qualifies as a water landing. Uh, I mean, you'll go down and hit the mud within six or eight inches, right? So, so some, of the, some of the questions around water landing don't count in the Rio Grande. You've got to at least go to a lake or something like that. But usually what I'm interested in in the water landing is uh, what kind of issues, especially if they're around other balloons? Because if there's two or three balloons going into the lake, it can create some hazardous situations. And I think it's important that people have thought about that. Because the balloon comes to a stop much faster in the lake than it does out on the field. So if, if you're coming in behind somebody and that first balloon hits the water, uh, you damn well better be gone or vending quickly. Uh, or it's going to get messy in a hurry. And, and also, I think it's important that they know that the bottom end will float. Tanks, even when they're totally full, will float. Wicker will float. I know that because I'm a repairman, too. Uh, and so when we were trying to do wicker repairs, 
we'd have to put the wicker into a tub of water and put something on top of it so it wouldn't float to the top. Because I had somebody tell me, well, what would you tell your passengers in a water landing? And they said, tell them to swim to shore. I can't swim. They're going to kill me. So they better know that the basket can float and that I can hold on to that. Or otherwise they're going to drown me because I can't swim. I can float, but I don't get anywhere. I grew up in South Dakota. There's not a lot of water there either. But, but if that happens, you, you, would, you want to try to get rid of your envelope because it doesn't float, typically. It typically sinks. After and it'll a while. pull you down eventually. But uh, try to get that thing disconnected if you can. Or cut. Probably have to cut it. You what can't disconnect yeah. it. <laughs> it's too much, too much stress on it. Thermals, most people here understand thermals to some degree. But I'll frequently have people tell me, and, and, and this is what their instructors have told them. They said, well, I'm just going to burn out of it. Well, what the heck does that mean? If the top of the thermal is where those cumulus clouds are up 20,000 feet, how are you going to burn out of it? I want them to explain exactly what their thought process is and what they're going to do. And they're not going to burn out the top of it. So they need to have a better understanding of thermals. Uh, and remember that just because the thermal goes up, that's not where I'm going to quit. I'm going to talk about the downdrafts. I'm going to talk about the shifts on the ground once those downdrafts hit the ground and go horizontal. You need to understand the entire process, not just that you can go up in a thermal and you'll spin. They need, it needs to go beyond that because just knowing that isn't safe. It really isn't because the thermals here can get big enough that they can hurt you. I had somebody recently tell me that they went to fly in the afternoon when we don't normally fly because they wanted to get in a thermal because they thought it was fun. It's like, really? You, you do recognize that that can hurt you? And he said, well, yeah, I recognize that too, but I don't care. Okay. What if you hit a house? Sounds like a hazardous attitude, right? It did to me. <laughs> This deflation. is a fun part. Yeah. There's a couple of things on deflation. Um, I don't know. Recently, um, Rob Schantz out of the insurance company started talking about taxiing operations. Strange term for the use in ballooning. But what he was fundamentally talking about was after landing, trying to get a balloon into a different position before it's pulled down. That's what he's describing as a taxiing operation. That particular operation, I gotta tell you, it drives me nuts. If, because if you've been around long enough, I assure you, you will have seen an example of you wished you would have pulled it down when you hit the ground. Because bad things happen during these taxiing operations. And so um, keep that deflation idea in the forefront of your mind. And even beyond that, sometimes people get on the ground and they just kind of quit then. Their brain goes dead and they go, ah, I'm done. You're not done. And so we come into the field going this way and they try and deflate the balloon this way. It's not going to go that way. They're not thinking about where the balloon is going to go and what it can hit when they try and deflate it because they've quit thinking by then. They can't quit until the balloon is packed up. And I'm still asking them questions then. Because I, I don't know if that's when you do it, but since we don't normally go with them to fuel, they're not done until we ask them about refueling, too. So just because they're on the ground and the balloon is packed up, we're not done. I agree. That's it? Uh, let's see. Uh, there were, you have a slide in there in your packet called paperwork. Uh, th this is the business of an applicant showing up with the right stuff, if you will, to make life better for the uh, oral portion of the exam. Um, you would think the application would be a fairly straightforward requirement. I got to tell you, four days ago, I had a check ride where they showed up without an 8710-1. <laughs> they didn't know it was required. So it's on the list, and it really is required. And Beth pointed out that it can be completed through IACRA, or 
you can just go on site and finish uh, an application online, uh, primarily to make it neat, if you will, provides a typewriter. You see, I know some of you aren't old enough to know what that is, but... but <laughs> I have um, one if you want one. I don't need it anymore. And then we, of course, look at the logbook for the requirements and the endorsements and the written knowledge test um, results. And sometimes getting ready for the oral, going through the paperwork, going through their logbooks, Don was talking about it being legible, making sure we know that everything's done. Sometimes that'll take an hour and a half just to make sure everything that's supposed to be done was done and, and that the paperwork is done right. It frequently is not, way too frequently. So yeah, if you have questions before you send a student for a check ride, that's the time to ask us. Yeah, it's, um, I must confess that I probably sacrifice my principles more on this point than any other one. Because we see logbooks where clearly training has taken place. It was a nice day, I flew with Charlie and signed off by Charlie. Um, it just, it's really inadequate, and quite frankly, it does not meet the requirements of Part 61. And we have the prerogative of sending that applic applicant away to get that problem fixed. And, and I have. If it's so bad, I really can't tell anything. And sometimes I'll say, well, where's your flight to 2000? And they'll say, oh, right here where it says, it says 8000 MSL. Well... That depends on where you were flying. If you were flying in Dillon, Colorado, that's underground. I mean, it needs to say that it was 2,000 feet above the ground. It depends on where you take off. Because maybe they say they went to 7,000 feet. Well, if they launched at, at the Rainbow Launch Site, that's already 5,800. They didn't go up 2,000. So they really need to write it so that we can tell that. And sometimes I call the instructor if they're not there and say, you need to come in and fix this stuff because we can't continue until you do. And once in a while, the, the uh, applicant will say, well, I did it right here, and he signed it, and here's where he went to this altitude. So it has to say 2,000. You wrote the rest of it right in the 2,000. We can't fix it. Ray and I can't fix it. The applicant and the instructor have to fix it. Let's see, the next thing, I think it was in your student notebook, was a sample application. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a slide for that. I wish we did. Um, th to me, there's only a couple of places that I'd like there to draw, draw your attention to. You got one on the uh, thumb drive? Yeah. It's not there. Um, let's see, if I had one in my hand. There it is. It was there oh, somewhere. There got it. Okay. God, that's not very clear, but, uh, it's in a, their book, do so. A, do you have a pointer? Is that a pointer? It has one, but I can't get it to work. I, um, I took this away from Beth because I knew we were getting close to the end, and I wanted to be sure we could. Uh, I finished on time on my previous presentation. <laughs> it doesn't happen that do you, often. Do you see the pointer? Okay. Uh, the one I, w I want to point out is this um, paragraph here, where it talks about type and yeah, aircraft, aircraft to be used, to be used. for your check ride. Um, if if you go on IACRA, you don't have very many choices for that. Uh, I think what you will say is something like LTA balloon. Yeah, it says LTA FB free and right, then free balloon. balloon. Yeah. Uh, the point I want to make is that these two slots over here apply to whatever you put over here. So if you put LTA free balloon, then all of your balloon hours count, and that's what you fill in in the two squares over here. On the other hand, if you enter over here, Aerostar RX-8, then you do not count your Cameron time when you fill these out. So it, it, you've got a lot of freedom in what you put in this first box, but once you put it there, it controls what's over there. Okay, uh, I find that's a place where there's frequently errors. Uh, probably more than any other thing on the sheet has been my experience. 
They've also changed it recently, so they have a place here that says a number of flights. This section And you drop over down, here. and it has hours, hours in balloons. They both have to be filled in. Yeah, those and are categories. And that's relatively new. Yeah. yeah, that whole section over there is new. Any questions about the application where you've had some doubts or? Yes, Barbara. Barbara. Yeah, you said there's two areas over there. There's one up here that says there's one up number here of flights. Number of flights. And, and down, down here, here, it's the flight hours in a balloon because it's LTA includes airships too. They want to know exact, specifically balloon time. Sure. Yeah, there no, is. No, but she means up here. Here, 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 here. Yeah, this is all still the same. That's the same. But these two blocks here have changed recently. And make sure that they've checked these boxes that say, no, I don't have any drug convictions if they don't, and no, I haven't failed the test, because they'll kick them back if those aren't marked. Yeah, this one here, or the one up here. And this is a big problem for private applicants. Have you ever held an FAA pilot certificate? Yes, a student, and they'll put no. Yes, they have. Yeah, a that's student certificate is a certificate. Yes, Dale. They can be included, but they're not required. Right. What's required is uh, information and support for the application that you're applying for. Now, they do prefer that you put all your time in there because then they have the most current record of what you've been doing, but you don't have to. Yes. No questions of why are allowed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's the FAA. Is there any way you can answer no to that question? Or do you leave it blank? Uh, you leave it blank is what people frequently do. Uh, I mean, there is a no there. You're saying, logically, does that make any sense? No. I, I'm not nearly as critical yes. as our master company as Beth is, but... As Don said, if you're there applying for a student certificate, that is going to mark, be marked no, unless they've previously had a pilot, student pilot certificate. Now they don't expire, but when they expired every two years, frequently we have people mark yes and put in their old student pilot certificate, ZZ something, and when it expired, and sometimes they did that two or three times, but since they don't expire anymore, that's probably not going to happen very often now. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Can we on quit? The, on the next page. Can we quit? <laughs> Why don't, not yet. One more page. Make sure that you bar, mark that box at the top that says recommendation. You know, it has to be marked right there. if you're signing them off for a check ride. You have to print and sign your name both. Yeah, it's, it's the same line, but you got to have both. It says print and sign on that line. But most people forget to check the recommendation box. Yeah, this box up here. Anything else? Thank you. And by the way, I, I think Beth feels this way too, but, but I, w I am very willing and anxious and want to be a resource to the community. So if you have any questions that come up as you prepare your student, give me a call or give Beth a call because Absolutely. it's so much easier to answer those questions before we start an oral or start to check right itself. And we'll try to make it as right as we can in advance. Now they won't let us let you sit in on the orals anymore. I used to encourage people to do that, have their instructor come in, so they'd know what we're going to cover. It wasn't supposed to be a secret. They won't let us do that anymore. I don't know what happened, but now the only people that can sit in on an oral or be present on the check ride is someone from the FAA. Right. So they've changed that recently. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.